afternoon and good evening. We have a wide range of participants from all over the world uh, registered for today's webinar. A very, very warm welcome to you all today. My name is Sakshi and I'm your host for today's webinar. I have a few housekeeping announcements in that regard. We have demarcated a good amount of time for Q&A towards the end of the webinar where you can either submit your question in writing under the Q&A option, or you can raise your hand to alert the host who will then unmute you so you can ask your question to the concerned panelist. Um, this webinar is going to be recorded and will be made available on YouTube. The presentation will also be made available to you. Um, once again, thank you so much for joining us. I will now invite Erin, um, who is the interim director of the Financial Transparency Coalition, of which CBGA, PALU, TJN and TJNA are members to make welcoming and introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Sachi. Um, I also welcome everyone with a good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. <laughs> um, I hope everyone is doing well. Um, we welcome you to this very timely and important discussion. Um, as you are probably well aware, we've made significant progress in the field of automatic exchange of information. But at the same time, there's so much progress to go, including making the system more inclusive and using the data for better accountability. We want to take this time to discuss with um, our very distinguished panelists and um, participants how we can use this data to, do, to better detect undeclared money and to uncover schemes and tax havens and other ways in which this information can be useful in the fight against illicit financial flows. We also aim to make this information uh, more available uh, to developing countries and to any others who may find this information useful. Um, as mentioned, this is a timely discussion. The, the FACTI panel just released its interim report. And there was a really important point in there where the, the term tax abuse was used in a, as a rights-based issue and not purely as a legalistic one. And this is something that we really want to build progress on and to advance. For the FTC, this is something we've been advocating for since 2018 at the national, regional, and global levels. Um, and we look forward to a lively discussion on how to make even greater progress and to build on this success. And we see this as a real opportunity to broaden the scope of discussion around transparency, include greater civic participation, and to continue the discussion on how illicit financial flows harm human rights and what we can do about it. So with that, I don't want to take too much of your time and I'll turn it back to Sachi to um, kick things off. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. Um, we have a brilliant moderator with us today who will take us through the webinar. Asha Ram Gobin is the executive director of the Human Rights Development Initiative and has been working on curtailing illicit financial flows from a human rights perspective. She's also a member of the Palu, of Palu's task force on illicit financial flows from Africa. Thank you so much, uh, Sakshi. I just want to make sure that you can all hear me. I'm not sure if you can see me because I can't see myself. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great, great. Um, so Tax Justice Network called for automatic exchange of information to combat tax havens many, many years ago. And at that point, some criticized them for being utopian. Um, but today, the call has been heard and steps are, have been taken to actually move down that path. And we, we are very privileged to have Andres uh, Noble, who's a researcher at Tax Justice Network, who's going to kick off the discussion today uh, with a presentation, a substantive presentation. And after that, uh, we're going to have a panel discussion. There are five panelists, and we'll get to uh, introducing them later. For now, I just want to uh, let you know that Andres has a lot of experience um, working on issues of beneficial ownership, exchange of information, and the common reporting standard. And I have to say what interests me most about this session and this presentation is that we are not looking at reports and information 
from leaked documents, but rather from uh, report, report, information from reports that are presented as part of a systemic and systematic, uh, a new system, I should say, of exchange of information. So Andres has highlighted that the system has many shortcomings, but also there are many positive elements and particularly uh, some positive elements for a developing country. So Andres, uh, without much more, uh, over to you. Great. Um, thank you, Asha, and thank you, Sakshi, and everyone for, for joining us. So we have been working and monitoring um, the new standard for automatic exchange of information that was published in 2014. So almost for six years now, identifying the loopholes, especially those that affect the inclusion of developing countries. And even for six years, we have been calling for statistics. I mean, we as civil society, we want to know at least, I mean, this information is of course confidential. So we do want to know some basic statistics about the macro level, about what's happening and who has money offshore and how much. And after six years, we finally got this year, two countries to publish that. Thanks also to the advocacy uh, and work by uh, civil society. And we have some people from Taxus Network, um, Australia and Germany, who might then tell us a bit more. So without further ado, I just want to go into um, the goal for today. First, I just want to um, give almost like a very five minute crash course on automatic exchange of information. So that everyone is at the same level and understand really why this is so relevant and especially how we can move this forward and, and go even deeper. Then it's a bit on how to use statistics because if they're published, now we have to use them. And then the last part is how to get more and even better data. And that has a role for civil society and also a role for tax authorities, both from developed countries that are joining, but also from those that are excluded from the system. So very briefly, how does automatic exchange of information work? The idea is that banks and other financial institutions in different countries will collect information about non-residents. They will send all this information to their tax authorities. And these tax authorities will compile all of this, sort it by country, and then send the information to each corresponding country. So in this case, in country B, the tax authorities will collect information, say, from residents from the green country, country G, and they will send that information. And then Ideally, the same thing will happen in country G, where the bank will collect information, send it to the local authorities, and that will be exchanged. So it does sound very simple, but it might not be like that. So then the question is, if it looks so simple, why are so many developing countries excluded? And there are three reasons. The first two ones are that you need a legal framework to exchange information. First, you need a treaty that allows automatic exchanges. The best case is joining the Convention on Mutual Administrative Assistance, the, 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 tax, um, the multi Multilateral Tax Convention, or if you have a tax information exchange agreement, a TIEA, or a double tax agreement that has a clause that enables automatic exchanges. Even if you have this, then you also need to sign the MCAA, the Multilateral Competent Authority Agreement, which pretty much says, okay, we will exchange information automatically based on the OECD's common reporting standard. That is in a way the easy part, I mean, for someone just to join the treaties. But then the, really po the real point that makes the exclusion for many developing countries is that they also need to be able to send information. Weirdly enough, there's no need for you to receive information. So many tax havens are actually refusing to receive information. But for developing countries, they have to be able to send information if they want to join the system. And what information is actually being exchanged? What this system enables is exchanges of account balance and the income from account holders. And there might be three different types of account holders. You might have an entity like company one, you might have an individual that directly owns a bank account. But interestingly, if the account holder is a company like company two, which is passive because most of its income is interest or dividends, in that case, they also have to identify the beneficial owner, John, and also report his account balance and income. And now the question is whose information will actually be exchanged? And in principle, it's only information about account holders or beneficial owners of a passive entity account holder if they are resident in a participating jurisdiction. We have about 100 countries that are participating, and one case is Germany, the other one is Australia. But then we have other two scenarios. One are many tax havens that are participating countries, that means that they are joining the system, they will send information, but they chose voluntary secrecy. They chose not to receive any information, even though 
no one is obliging them on what to do with that information. And then we have non-participating jurisdictions such as Vietnam uh, that for some reason is unable to join the system yet. In these two cases, especially for tax havens, there's a golden visa risk. So anyone uh, offering their golden visas, then it's a way to avoid being disclosed under automatic exchanges. And now this is important just to understand the, concept, the impact on statistics. Some countries apply the no wider approach, and that is Switzerland or Liechtenstein, where banks only collect information about those who are resident in a participating jurisdiction, such as Germany. Germany, on the contrary, is applying the wider approach. And that means that banks collect information on all non-residents, regardless if they are from a participating or non-participating jurisdiction, but the information stays with the bank. The bank only reports to authorities information about participating ones. And then the best case is the widest approach in which banks collect information about everyone and they also send that information to everyone. And that would enable statistics to cover all residents, including those from excluded countries. And that is precisely what happened. In the case of Australia, since they are applying the widest approach, they publish statistics about the money held by residents from 248 jurisdictions. So we have that, that data is public. Germany, on the contrary, only since they don't apply the widest and only apply the wider, so in a way it's almost the same as, as no wider, we only have information about those that are from participating jurisdictions. So Germany published information only about residents from 66 countries only. Now, how to use statistics? The great thing about Australia is that they publish information about, as I said, many, many countries, especially those that are excluded. So now we have basic information about offshore money. In this table, I mean, again, I only cover the top 10 by balance from Asia and from Africa. And so we can see Vietnam, the Philippines, Laos, and we can see how much money in total they have and the number of accounts. So we could, in a way, estimate how many people that might be people or companies, because we don't know that. Now, the bad thing about Australian statistics is that they only published account balance and number, but there's no data on the income of those accounts, and there's no distinction between entity or individuals. And as I said, the account holder may be a company or may be a person. However, only with that simple information on number of accounts and balance accounts, we can still do some basic ratio and take the average and then tax even stand out. So if we look at the absolute balance, we have many people from the US, UK, China, New Zealand, and that, so that might make sense. But when we do the average, and that is the balance divided by number of accounts, we see that the ones on top are all tax havens, Marshall Islands, BBI, Jersey, Cayman, Bermuda, and Guernsey. Germany, something very similar happened. The good thing about Germany, even though they have a reduced uh, number of, of countries, and so we have no information from Germany about those that are excluded, the good thing is that they have published number of accounts, account balance, and income, and for three years. And these are, they have done this for German accounts held abroad in 88 countries, but then for non-residents from 66 countries that have their money in German banks. And a very similar thing happens when we look at German statistics. When we look at the absolute values, most of them are EU countries and rather big countries from the EU or countries that are very close to Germany. So both in numbers of accounts or the account balance, we have Switzerland, France, Austria, Italy, Spain, which makes sense in a way. But when we look at the average, then again, many of the tax havens or outliers stand out. So on average of balance account, we have Jersey, Monaco, Guernsey, Liechtenstein, Cook Islands, Panama, when we look at the income per account, the average, we have Guernsey, Monaco, Panama, Malta, Jersey again. But even for cases which are in tax havens or even regardless of being a tax haven or not, these statistics can also tell us some outliers. And when we look at the average income in the Netherlands based on the account, it gives us a ratio of 2,500%. And then when we look at the next countries, even Saudi Arabia or Singapore, we're talking about the 50%. So that already tells us that there might be something wrong going on in the Netherlands. There is some mistake in the reporting or some maybe avoidance scheme that could be and should be further investigated. Now, what to do with all of these statistics? So for civil society organizations, the great thing that they can do is that they may start estimating offshore holdings. I mean, that refers both to those from excluded countries as well as from those from participating jurisdictions. Because again, as I said, even for Germany or Australia, the only ones getting the data are authorities. 
civil society has no idea about what's happening. So every time they publish statistics, we may know how much money residents from each country have abroad. But now in the case of excluded countries, now they have something which is at least basic, but it's the best that they can get. So it's already a great thing where to start. So civil society should also start doing more advocacy and hoping that their countries will join automatic exchanges. But at the same time, we should start holding authorities to account and then checking whether they are using the data that they received, whether they can publish any statistics on the undeclared accounts from resident taxpayers, and if any sanctions have been imposed on those tax dodgers. For authorities, we hope that they will start investigating outliers, such as the case of the Netherlands, but also investigating the use of tax havens. And imagine if just by looking at two different data, so we have number of accounts and account balance, and just by doing that ratio, that average, we could already distinguish tax havens. Imagine all the many more things that authorities could do once they actually have the data in their hands and have much more details. Now, the question is how to get even more data and even better data. So one thing that could happen is that we need more countries to publish statistics. And of course, this refers especially for financial centers, because we know that in financial centers, that's where most people from the world hold their money. And there are three different strategies that have been uh, implemented in different countries. In the case of Uruguay, a journalist made a Freedom of Information Act request. And based on that, they published this very basic list. So it's not that interesting. It only refers to how many accounts were reported. And so it says to Italy, 4,000, Spain, 3,000. So it's interesting, but it doesn't say a lot. In Australia, there was a legal amendment, uh, thanks to TGN Australia. And after that, they published uh, information, as I said, on 284 jurisdictions. Unfortunately, they only published statistics about the total accounts and the balance. And again, the information was published as a PDF. So there was a lot of time and effort just to put that into an Excel and transform that and so that we could actually do the analysis. In the case of Germany, it was a parliamentary inquiry. Uh, and again, unfortunately, information was done as a PDF. So it did take a lot of time just to transform that uh, into a digitalized version that we could actually work with. But again, it's still a great start. So what, what else could we ask for? Uh, and as I said, we even prepared a template uh, six years ago describing all the statistics that, that countries should publish. It hasn't happened yet, but these are the things that we should keep in mind for when we ask for more things and that hopefully will happen in the near future. First, as I said, we need countries to apply the widest approach so that they have information and they publish statistics on all residents, regardless if they are from a country that is participating in the CRS or not. I mean, especially we want statistics on those that are excluded. And that's why everyone should follow Australia uh, and four up more countries that are, are doing this. We need more information disclosure, so number of accounts, balance, and income. We need this to be disaggregated by account holder. Is this an entity? Is this an individual account holder? Or is this the beneficial owner of a passive entity account holder? It would be very useful if we also had information disaggregated by the type of financial institution. I only gave the example of a bank, but the CRS doesn't cover only banks. It covers depository banks, custodial banks, investment entities, and also some types of insurance companies. So if we knew what, in which type of financial institution residents have their money and their income, that already tells us a lot about what might be happening in terms of tax avoidance and tax evasion. And of course, it would be great if countries were to publish both types of statistics what non-residents have in their local banks, but also what their residents have in foreign bank accounts. And that is what Germany did. I only showed uh, at least what, what we care about now is uh, for countries to publish what non-residents have in each country. So that's what I showed about Germany. But Germany also published uh, this data for what Germans have abroad. And now, uh, finally, this is the last slide, is about what authorities, especially from excluded countries, could do and ideally should do. So the best thing and the first thing they need to do is to have a treaty that would enable them to exchange information. The best case is to sign and then ratify the Convention on Mutual Administrative Assistance in tax matters, because in that means they will have assistance, they can exchange information without having to sign a double tax agreement in which they would be losing uh, revenues by having to lower their withholding taxes. So the best thing that could happen is that they sign this convention. The next point would be to join the automatic exchange as long as they could, um, as I said, send information. 
the Global Forum has also some pilot projects that they can join so as to, to receive uh, some help in, in, in order to do this. But until they join Automatic Exchange, there are two ideas that should be tested. I mean, we are not aware of any country doing this, but this is what could happen. And the, one, the first one is to do a group request. Many of you know that when, for countries that have exchanges on request, and that is what many countries have, there's a prohibition of fishing expeditions. So you cannot simply say, oh, I found out that there are uh, $100 million of my residents in your country, tell me who they are. That it doesn't happen like that. But based on this information, and if there's some more data that none, no one has declared that, maybe with some nuances, a country could try and make a group request and try to get some information about all of those residents who have um, money in Australia or in other countries once they publish statistics. And I would be happy to, to disclose, to describe more what a group request would require. And the other option is to maybe informally ask for a spontaneous exchange. So countries are also allowed to do it automatically, of course, upon request, but also spontaneously. So if they find information that might be relevant for a different country, they could simply exchange it with them as long as they have a treaty. That is what happened with France. After France received the information from Falciani about many of the Swiss leaks data, they shared it spontaneously with other countries so that then they could use this information as well uh, in a legal way. So that's what maybe could be explored as a way to also get more data uh, they wouldn't get all the data because for that they would need to be properly joining the CRS and the automatic system, but maybe some spontaneous more data about who they, these people are, if they are entities or individuals. That's an idea that could be tested. Okay, thank you very much. And I uh, will share the presentation with the two links to the blogs that full, thoroughly describe uh, these two statistics and what could be done about that. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andres. Um you really helped us unpack complex statistics here, I have to say. Uh, what, what stood out for me was uh, something relating to COVID uh, bailout plans. And some countries like Denmark, Poland, for example, have said that um, COVID relief packages will not be available to companies that, are, that, that have any connection with tax havens. And uh, perhaps these this kind of data, this kind of, these kinds of st statistics can help authorities identify those companies. Um, so thank you also for helping us as civil society and journalists. I understand that we have a range of different types of professionals on this, uh, uh, participating in this um, webinar. Thank you for helping all of us try and figure out what we can actually do and how we can engage with these uh, with these statistics thank you very much again and i must also say um thank you also for translating a fairy tale what started out automatic exchange of information years ago was considered just a fairy tale you've made it very clear that actually it's not just a fairy tale there's a great deal of potential in this tool to uh, help us address a range of problems in the global financial system. So thank you again. Um, so we'll move directly to the panel now and we'll take questions and, and uh, comments later all together at the end, uh, Andres. So um, if you could just also, um, uh, you know, just pick up on issues that panelists might, might raise. Uh, later on when we're closing off the session. So today we have five panelists, all from the Global South, and they're all steeped in the field of international taxation, automatic exchange of information, uh, tax integrity, anti-corruption, financial transparency. They all come from diverse professional and geographical backgrounds, and they will help us navigate the long windy and bumpy road ahead of us around this uh, automatic exchange of information. So let's begin with Ifraim Murenzi. Ifraim, you have been a program officer at uh, the African Tax Administration Forum for a few years now, and you coordinate their work on exchange of information. After many years, I understand that you've spent in in the Revenue Authority in Rwanda. So can you share your insights on how the availability of these banking statistics can help African countries based on your experience? Thank you very much, Asha, and uh, 
Greetings from ETAF Secretariat and specifically from the Executive Secretary of ETAF, Rogan Watt. Uh, since the minutes you gave us are not very many, I'll quickly go to the questions and the possible answers. The other day, and to be precise, last night, I think I was watching uh, uh, a program on Al Jazeera, and uh, they were talking about capital flight and illicit financial frauds. When you see the, the figures that were being quoted by the UN, these are frightening figures of about 89 billion annually. And if that money could really be staying on the African continent, then I'm sure we wouldn't be having any problem with sustainable development goals. And the availability of those banking information would there for me that if a country can know that some of its citizens have like 10 billion in Swiss account or in Panama or in Luxembourg, I can assure you that whether it is the opposition parties, assuming they are not involved, or the civil societies or non-government organizations, so they would put pressure on government to ensure that that kind of money is recovered. Of course, recovery is another cumbersome aspect. So it's not as easier said than done. But the availability of figures would be an eye opener and a motivator for the government to really look around, do inward, you know, looking, and decide, say, can we afford to lose this money? How did this money end up there? Did it go through weak exchange, exchange controls? Is it because there were some multinational companies that never paid money? Or high net worth individuals that for one reason or another, we are able to take away money out of the country. So those figures are really very important. The statistics would be very good for any country to understand that the situation back home is not easier. And of course, when it comes to developing countries, you know very well that they are always needed. No infrastructure, no education, health facilities in pathetic situation. So you need to understand that the availability of those information would perfectly motivate the government, any sensible and democratic government would really look around and say enough is enough. Let's come to a complete stop when it comes to this capital fight. So this is one of the areas I think that uh, those availability of, I mean, of the banking information through automatic information would really somehow make a difference when it comes to government action. Mm -hmm. We are aware of these uh, taxpayers who come and make, you know, fire returns in most cases maximum loss, minimum profits. So if, if you realize that one of those taxpayers could be among those guys holding accounts given by the, the banks, of course the, 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 the unfortunate part is that sometimes, sometimes most of this information is aggregate. They don't come up with you know, individual accounts and how much. So they, sometimes they, if you, you saw what Andre was presenting, they will say Switzerland, uh, Romania has got uh, 2,000 residents or non-residents holding accounts in Switzerland, but they never come and say Ephraim or Robert has 10 million yeah. what. But in any case, I really feel that during the filing of returns, uh, the, the tax administration, national tax administration, would really understand that definitely something wrong is going on. If you permanently and consistently declare loss, all of a sudden you have profit somewhere, in Virgin Islands, then the, the National Tax Administration will definitely uh, go back to the drawing board and maybe conduct an audit so that that money is returned. Mm. But again, there's something that we negate those figures, we get those, that, those informations. The unfortunate part, do we normally act? And I, I remember you mentioned that we don't have to talk about the leaks or what. But even if these leaks, Panama leaks or whatever papers, uh, nobody knows it after those leaks are come out. And that's the beginning of the end. Nobody, we just wait yeah. for another week, I mean, the, the leaks to come up. So yeah. we need to act. It's not about mm -hmm. availing the information. Now that you have the information, so what next? So mm -hmm. it's time for practical actions after mm -hmm. this availability of the information. Mm. Uh, definitely, uh, did you ask the second question to continue? 
No, no. Before we continue with the second question, yes. I just want to highlight certain things that you brought up here. And I think what you, what you highlighted uh, around beneficial ownership, that we don't know exactly who the beneficial owner of the, of the, of the accounts and of the uh, money is, because these, the statistics don't actually provide that. It's a, it's a limitation that, is, uh, that has been highlighted also by Andres and Tax Justice Network in the past. Wow. But it's something that we need to, to look at going forward as to how to, to address that. The next thing that you brought up re relating to loopholes, that this information will help countries actually identify how the money has, has left, you know, whether it's been through multinationals or how it's left. So that once you've identified loopholes, you can then start addressing those loopholes. But and and you know this this uh, something is going wrong. This statement, this phrase that you said, this helps you to identify that something is going wrong. I think the leaks have demonstrated that something certainly is rotten in the state of Denmark. But as you say, action is where everything falls flat in on our continent in some respects. And coming to that now. Do you see what do you see as the interest and momentum within the continent around joining the system of uh, uh, automatic exchange? What is stopping African countries from joining the system? Okay, the, the moment, yeah. thank you, thank you very much. Uh, the momentum is there, and I think this uh, they are in the declaration. I, th I think it's one of those you know testimonies to suggest that. Uh, we have, I think, now 29, I don't remember, African countries, whereby they are trying everything possible to eliminate uh, recent financial flows. So there is that momentum, but the challenge has always been, you know, there is the intent, and then there is the action. I think I had already mentioned it. Sometimes these, we join these uh, organizations, we go to ratification, it takes six months. Yes. Then, then after that, you know, there is that cumbersome kind of bureaucracy that somehow tax administrations normally tend to take the lead, but the tax mm. administrations are not the sole proprietors when it comes to this aspect of uh, banking, information from the banking. So it mm. needs the whole government, the entire concerted efforts of the government to ensure that this situation is sorted out. But again, yes. there is also those people who still look at the automatic and information as something oriental, something from far away. They are looking at mm. the short-term solutions of quick audits, you know, customs collections, but the automatic exchange of information is, is, is something that can sustain revenue collection in the long term. Other than, mm. so revenue administrations are constrained by the budget, but by the end of the day, they don't appreciate the fact that this information is there for them because it will act as a deterrent anyway, and that will lead to increased tax compliance. So momentum is there, but again, there is slow in action. Mm, mm. Well, let me say thank you very much. We've gone a little bit over time, I think, so, but, but thank you very, very much for those insights. Um, they, as you say, there's definitely potential for African countries to detect offshore holdings and understand avoidance and secrecy schemes more deeply, it's, it's up to us to actually take the, act, to take the action. And, and as you say, you don't use the phrase as such, but the whole of government approach is required. You can't deal with these things in a piecemeal, piecemeal basis. And there are indeed vested interests that would want us to not address them but we need to have a long-term approach to, to it. So thank you. And let me say in Kenya, Rwanda, Urakozi, Ephraim. Urakozi now. Thank you. Okay. okay. So now turning to you, Nana Akua Mensa, you have been doubling up as a legal officer with the Ghana Revenue Authority, while at the same time you've been providing technical support to uh, ATAF on exchange of information and transparency. So we have seen and we've heard now also that the availability of data really helps revenue authorities to detect wrongdoing, but this presupposes an efficient and highly skilled administration. In your view, which countries 
And for now, let's just exclude those that are already part of the automatic of, uh, exchange of information system. So which countries uh, in Africa do you think could actually benefit from such disclosures? And at the same time, maybe even set an example for other countries? Thank you very much, and um, everybody for giving us the opportunity to talk about this. Um, I, I usually say in every panel that I talk about automatic exchange that I feel like it's a lot more relevant for developing countries, in particular Africa, than a lot of the other tax transparency initiatives that are out there. Um, and in, in a, a little bit, it's based on um, or, uh, a lot of other forms of tax transparency require a higher level of um, initiative on the part of the jurisdiction that is um, seeking to detect um, tax evasion or tax avoidance, or basically to even that tool. But when it comes to tax exchange, it's really, um, a smoke signal that directs you to um, possible non-compliance or inefficiencies in your system. However, in the same vein, implementation of a tax exchange requires a lot of effort from a jurisdiction in terms of resources, physical will, um, infrastructure, um, and, and even technical capacity. So um, in that vein, your it's very, very layered and textured because being able to determine what African jurisdiction has that level of expertise ready to do that is dicey. Um, I think even after a jurisdiction commits to automatic exchange, once they start implementing it, they might find that they are not as prepared as they thought they were before they got into the process. A lot of the jurisdictions that committed and have started exchanging have challenges. My country being one of the, we had to move our date from 2018 to 2019 due to challenges we face once we start the implementation process. So, um, I, I don't know if I could actually list any jurisdictions that are ready. What I can't say is that the benefits for automatic exchange in Africa are immeasurable. Um, I think a few jurisdictions already noticed that. I think recently Kenya and Morocco have committed to exchange in 2022. Um, and there are initiatives in place to help you kind of determine what, whether or not you are ready to automatically exchange. Global Forum has a program and also doing programs to jurisdictions assess their level of for automatic action. Um, I, in my head, I would probably say I'm looking at countries like Uganda and who have done significant work in tax transparency in Africa already when it comes to on request um, as having probably the good infrastructure ready for them to try automatic exchange. Again, with sound strategy, a good plan, this is something that I believe is feasible for them and could actually help jurisdictions to, to be motivated to do this. Um, as, as ATA, we really say that um, Africa is very unique and a lot of things cut across for African jurisdictions. Sometimes the best person you can learn from is another African jurisdiction. So then I would make a plea to the existing um, committed jurisdictions to kind of work on some kind of South cooperation to help other African jurisdictions do this. Again, mm. The more African jurisdictions are to do automatic exchange, the easier it will be because then as a block, they can make um, strategic decisions and make um, the, the implementation process that suit Africa and make it easier to achieve this as a, a block individually. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do definitely need to be working in solidarity with each other on our continent, absolutely. Um, you, you must have noticed coming from Ghana, and I'm sure you've also looked at South Africa, um, some of the countries that are actually already part of the automatic exchange of information system, but are struggling to implement. Um, so what do you think, you've already touched on some aspects, but what, what would you say are the key areas that cause this difficulty for, for countries, and what is ATAF actually doing to help to help with all of that? Well, um, thank you for that question. Um, so primarily my experience working with Ghana and then my experience with AIDS, say that one of the major challenges is resource and capacity constraints. Um, AUI, automatic exchange, is complex and new. And that combination is actually very challenging. Because, um, the standard is, or is in the process of evolving, it's a set in stone, uh, 
standard and as more and more jurisdictions implement challenges come up so pose and it evolves now for African jurisdictions where a lot of the time our infrastructure is not as developed as developed countries um, very challenging it feels like the, the goalpost keeps moving keeps and, moving and, yes and this yeah. is actually huge in trying to implement automatic exchange but in the same vein, I actually think it's a plus that uh, more African countries get involved in implementation. Then we control or effect some kind of change in the implementation process based on our challenges that we are facing as well. Because now challenges that are faced are mostly by uh, countries that are being addressed or the modifications that are being made in response to the challenges developed facing. We need to also that we put in a lot of information challenges we are facing as African Americans. Mm. We mm. Mm. those modifications are also addressing our issues. Um, mm. Another big bottleneck is political will. Now we need to make sure that um, there's political will that is across the decision by Africans. We want to try this, and that we are making the efforts or we are dedicating the resources to do this. Automatic exchange is very resource intensive to implement. Um, the benefits are for the but it's resource intensive to, um, to, to implement. So um, it's better for Africa if we're able to come together and highlight these resource challenges. And so, so, so even when it comes to subscription fees and, and um, you know, cost mm. of software, and cost of IT, all of this is mm. quite substantial. And to go to a country where they are stuff, build roads and and put in good health healthcare infrastructure, and talk about subscription fees to join something that might benefit mm. them down the line, it, it's a lot of it's a lot to ask. So yeah. um, that's um, um, organizations like ATAF come in, and we are to try and kind of link the needs of all jurisdictions and make a a concentrated fee, our concentrated based on our mm. situations and the challenges that we are facing in Africa. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you so much for that, Nana. Um, I think one of the one of the key uh, areas that um, that I pick up from you is this sort of vicious cycle where automatic exchange of information requires resources. We're losing resources through illicit financial flows. You need automatic exchange of information to bring back the resources. And it's just this vicious cycle that we, that we are confronted with. And, and it's good that ATAF comes in to help kind of cut through this, uh, this problem and hopefully uh, slow the process down a little bit so that when, as we're playing catch up, we, um, you know, we, 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 we're not so far behind and we actually take the benefit of, um, of the sort of uh, the process that has already unfolded. So thank you very much. And um, I'm now trying to, to say thank you in local languages. So for you, Medase, I think I said it right. Oh. I, I said it. <laughs> got it right, actually, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we move from uh, the Africa focus now to a more global, um, uh, gl the Global South. And let me now bring you in, Abdul uh, Chaudhry. You are a consultant in the Policy Planning and Research Division of the Ministry of External Affairs in India before taking on this position as Program Officer at South Center. And as you know, we are all witnessing a proliferation and a rise of financial centers in the Global South that also operate within a framework of secrecy. How do you see the availability of this type of data impacting upon this phenomenon? Thank you, Asha. It's um, very nice to be in this webinar. And I would first like to congratulate Andres for his amazing work and his uh, passion and commitment actually towards the developing countries. This is really very insightful to read about his blogs and to see his presentation. And it's uh, for a lot of help for us going forward. As for your question, um, so there are two aspects to it. The first aspect is that 
the move towards setting up international financial centers in many uh, developing countries and emerging markets, if we can broaden the term, is driven by the reality that these exist uh, traditionally in the global north. And it's uh, driven by this effort to have some sort of control on their own jurisdictions regulatory wise. Um, because it's going to happen anyway. So you might as well have these uh, centers at least within your control to some extent and try to limit the amount of profit shifting that happens. Global uh, South, they could see a rise in demand for their services as more and more traditional tax havens and financial centers begin to open up to transparency agreements like the multilateral convention. Um, to the extent that these are uh, out of these agreements. But I think it's only a matter of time before even the uh, financial centers in developing countries are forced to sign up to these, uh, to these conventions. So I don't think it would be too long. Mm -hmm. That being said, if you look at some of the details of these uh, financial centers, many of them are really driven by the desire to offer a high degree of uh, financial services sophisticated financial services, which is difficult for them to provide otherwise, because these are developing countries with uh, limited resources. They really try to concentrate the resources in a particular region. And there you try to have an expanded financial market, a capital market. Uh, and the desire behind this is to really bring in investment into their countries, which is a very legitimate desire by developing countries. So you're trying to focus and concentrate our efforts into a certain particular region to provide a high degree of sophisticated financial services. So I think when we talk about financial centers in developing countries, we need to make a distinction between the sophistication of financial services which are offered, uh, the regulatory uh, ease uh, which they are also offering, financial and in fiscal incentives which they're offering, and financial secrecy. These are all different things and clubbing them together is not helpful. Uh, right. And we need to have this nuance when we respond to these upcoming financial centers in the global south. So if a country, I don't want to name any countries, but if a country says that we have a financial center where you can come, you can get good insurance services, you can get access to good brokerages, you can get access to good capital markets and so on, uh, that itself is not a bad thing. And if they say we give you high quality services, single window clearance, so you can get things done very quickly, which otherwise if you go through the normal route, it might take you a lot of time and a lot of corruption and all these things involved, that's not a bad thing. The problem really comes when there is secrecy involved and when there is um, harmful tax and harmful fiscal incentives. So for yes. those who are campaigning in this space of tax justice, I think we need to maintain this distinction between the sophistication of financial services, which is driven by the desire to bring in investment quickly and in a mm. systematic way, and uh, the harmful aspects, which are financial secrecy and um, tax incentives, which, which is what the focus should be in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, listening to you, I remember um, at the launch of the FACTI report, the interim report of the FACTI panel, there was a representative from Barbados there who, um, who was talking, you know, almost uh, with that plea, understand us, understand where we're coming from and the frustration that they have with the goalposts being shifted all the time. Um, so I think, I think um, your emphasis on let's look at what is harmful, let's look, at, let, let's look at the problem and not just throw, as we colloquially say, the baby out with the bath water. Um, it's really important. So this is a, this is a really interesting question. Um, I have to say, it's not formulated by me. I, have, I must not take credit for it, but I, I'm very I am also very curious as to the answer. Do you see, that there's any potential for financial centers to actually help developing countries? So I, by, do... by, you know, for, by, by, for example, sharing data and publishing stats, and we say that secrecy and harmful incentives are the problem. Do we see that these problems can be actually addressed and that financial centers have some sort of, um, you know, that they, that they actually planning on addressing it? So um, I would say that by becoming transparent about the data which they have, they can be of enormous help to developing countries by saying that residents from these developing countries have accounts in their, in their, in their jurisdictions and what, and as Andres said, I completely 
support his recommendations that as disaggregated as it is, are these held in depository accounts and are they held by trusts or investment uh, vehicles? I mean, all of the more disaggregated this data is, it would be of enormous help to developing countries because it would help them to make better tax assessments. Now, that being said, uh, the other part of your question, which is that really what would, um, uh, why would they do it is I think, um, uh, is, is I think the real challenge over here. And to uh, yeah. answer that question, I think there are, uh, there's first a need to distinguish between the kind of financial centers you have. And uh, to look at it simply, we can group them into two categories. The first category would be uh, big financial centers like the United States, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, uh, big countries in a way. And the second one would be these really small uh, tax havens like the Cayman Islands uh, mm. uh, and so on, uh, Jersey, Guernsey, the Isle of Man, et cetera. Um, and I think both of them have uh, separate uh, responses. So, uh, in a, so I know that I have limited time, but I'd try to just go over these responses as quickly as I can. So um, the first aspect is what are the arguments that can be made to big financial centers like the US or the UK? I think there are two basic arguments which we can think about to encourage them to say that it's in your own interest to publish this data and make it, uh, uh, and, and make it available as disaggregated as possible, as has been advocated by Andres. The first argument is that this is money which is not going to result in tax losses to your tax administration. And Tax Justice Network has done some very good data uh, showing recently uh, from the OECD's database how uh, the, the revenue gained to the financial centers, to the tax havens, was very, very little actually. So this is not, this is not a zero sum game. It's, it's not that by making this data public and if you can make better assessments, we are going to lose money uh, because mm. this is a big concern right now, especially in the times of COVID. The second argument which we would have to, which we can think about is that this is data which would really help reduce illegal migration. And let's be very frank, this is a big concern, yeah. especially when many of these developed countries are ruled by right-wing governments. So uh, to bring them on board politically, this is another aspect that uh, if, I mean, if you don't want them, if you don't want these people to come, then stop exploiting and robbing their countries in the first place. Um, yeah. Now, the second uh, aspect is that who is going to make these arguments? And here is really where you need North-South civil society cooperation because the lobbying has to be done by civil society organizations based in the North. And again, I would really congratulate Tax Justice Network, Tax Justice Network Australia in particular for uh, following up and getting that data by the Australian government published, mm -hmm. which has been of so much help. And we really hope mm -hmm. that more such kind of collaborations happen. Uh, the second aspect is uh, how do we respond to these small tax havens like Cayman Islands, Jersey, Guernsey? Because here there's not much of a stake. There's not much trade happening with these countries and so on. And uh, I think there are two aspects. One is collective action, which can be taken by developing countries. And the second is individual action. I know I don't have much time, so I'll just focus on some individual steps which developing countries can take. Uh, so I want to talk about Ecuador. Ecuador has taken some very interesting steps. So what Ecuador did in, uh, I think, 2007 or so, they published a list uh, of countries which they officially recognize as tax havens. So they have three lists. One is uh, tax havens. The second one are... Um, preferential tax regimes, and the third one are jurisdictions with low tax rates. So this is an official list by the government of Ecuador. And um, uh, depending on uh, the taxpayer's engagement with each of these three countries, you have a different tax treatment. So for example, if you uh, have income sourced from a tax haven, or if you, have, uh, if you have accounts over there, then you're denied certain benefits, such as exemptions, yeah. such as uh, deductions. Um, you, there's a higher income tax rate, which is applied to you. So it kind of disincentivizes uh, these things. Mm. The second thing is that um, if a country wants to get off this list of Ecuador, and Ecuador is a very good example because it's not a huge country. It doesn't have that much of political power. Mm. So many other countries can actually follow from their lead. Uh, the other thing is that if a country wants to get off this tax haven list, they have to sign an agreement with Ecuador to exchange information or to sign up to international standards. So that way, a lot of countries have actually turned around their policies, maybe not completely, but at least with respect to Ecuador, which is what uh, matters in this case, ultimately. Um, in fact, there's a policy uh, brief on this uh, published by the South Center, which uh, I'll just share in the chat. So if anyone's interested, they can have a look at it. Um, and um, yeah, and uh, uh, then of course, there's a whole set of issues at the multilateral level, for example, the uh, the multilateral convention which andres was talking about uh, section mm. 7 on the common reporting standard it requires full reciprocity and even there mm. uh, it's it's kind of like uh, uh, only if the other country agrees then you can get the data so there's a lot of that but uh, i mean within my time limit mm. and some of my comments mm. and your questions so thank you thank thanks thank you so much abdul it just goes to show that we are definitely not powerless as developing countries though we may be small 
we have different uh, options that are available to us. Since we're running out of time, let me move directly to uh, Aurora, Aurora uh, Akambal, uh, who worked previously at o you, you worked previously at o OECD, and now you are um, you are the Asian Development Bank. So let me ask you. Let me get to the question directly. I find it very interesting that the ADB decided to introduce a regional tax hub. But uh, I understand that in the past, this uh, initiative was, um, was opposed by countries like Japan and Russia. And now it's, it's really required um, to address resource constraints. So how do you see this tax hub evolving? And particularly, how do you see it helping low-income countries in the region? Thank you, uh, Asha, for your question. And before I reply very quickly, I'd just like to thank uh, the organizer for inviting ADB to speak on this panel. And also uh, a further thank you to Andres for this very insightful presentation and also for the articles that uh, I read before uh, joining you on this panel. Um, let me just start with uh, first um, recognizing uh, the importance of promoting uh, domestic resource mobilization and international tax cooperation uh, to assist ADB's developing members country in achieving the SDG and addressing the challenges that are brought uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the challenges that are faced by our DMCs are not new and actually are aggravated with this pandemic. Uh, the need therefore to broaden tax base and step tax evasion is crucial and um, it will help uh, also uh, the country recover in the long run and phase out the fiscal stimulus that they had to implement in this crisis. Um, the observation is that today 19 DMCs out of 46 are not global forum members and, and have not committed to automatic exchange of information. And among those who have joined, uh, eight uh, in our DMCs have not specified yet the date uh, they will implement it. Uh, additionally, Asia and Pacific is the only region that does not have a pan-regional tax association to develop regional dialogue on tax matters. So in this context, it appeared very clear for ADB as an international financial institution uh, with the mandate to foster the economic growth, cooperation and development of uh, our DMCs to strengthen our assistance for DMCs. The regional hub, as announced by the President Massa during the annual meeting, is therefore crucial in achieving this goal because it will provide an open platform for countries and development partners to collaborate and share experiences and practical knowledge. Um, I think that was the main message during this annual meeting from all the panelists uh, that uh, supported this initiative. Coordination of development efforts is necessary to ensure efficiency and no duplication of efforts uh, in the region. Uh, it's also very important that we, we develop a regional uh, dialogue between the tax policy makers and the revenue bodies. And, and this regional hub will facilitate uh, this dialogue and the coordination between these two very important uh, government bodies. Um, in terms of what uh, Andres has uh, explained in his presentation, uh, particularly on what the authorities of um, the country that are excluded of, uh, from the automatic exchange of information framework, uh, what can we do to, to actually uh, help them? This regional hub will focus uh, its attention on DRM and ITC, and particularly in our technical assistance. So in the implementation of this hub, uh, we will um, provide assistance in uh, joining the MAC, explaining uh, how the, the standard currently works, really providing an assistance that is tailor-made to the needs of each DMCs. And uh, we will do all this by um, coordinating the efforts with other development partners. Uh, I, I really like this sentence that was um, said, this comparison that was drawn uh, during uh, our annual meeting. Uh, in this hub, ADB will play the role of a family doctor and will accompany basically the patient, our DMCs, all along, including um, addressing them to the most adequate specialists, which would be our development partners. So I think, uh, and to cut short my, my answer, um, this is really why this hub is timely, 
we are in this COVID crisis and countries, DMCs need uh, more revenue in the long run. And um, it's time that we, we coordinate um, our regional efforts. Mm. Very quickly, one more question, very quickly. We've seen that the quality of the banking statistics are not quite up to standard and need to be improved. There are certain aspects that are, that are limited. What challenges do you foresee for the, for your, for, for the region, uh, even with this limited um, information that is publicly available? Yeah, um, that's a that's a very uh, difficult question, I would say, because uh, on the quality of data, I think uh, this is really ongoing work. So um, I, I believe that indeed, and, and from what uh, Andreas shared in his presentation, um, more work is needed indeed to improve it. Uh, I think it's simply because this data uh, is being exchanged only for, for two years. And, um, yeah. and I think that the peer review that will be undertaken, and we saw it with the standard on exchange of information yeah. upon request, we will uh, surely see some improvements. And, mm -hmm. um, and also, I believe the statistics uh, are critical to, to measure the impact and effectiveness of the standard mm -hmm. and are a very good source of information for our DMCs. Alone, this might not be enough uh, to, to really give this push to our mm -hmm. DMCs to collect effectively their fair share. So yeah. we would need to, to supplement uh, this with modern tax administration equipped with the right legal framework, capacity building. I, I'm echoing what uh, the yeah. other panelists have already said, but I think mm -hmm. this is really um, the key and prerequisite to get yeah. quality data and a better use of the information by our low income countries. And this regional tax hub seems to be well poised to actually help with all of that, right? With the coordination, capacity building and everything. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry that we have to rush through this, but um, thank you very much for that. Uh, Irene, let me come to you. Irene Obonji Odida, who was a member of the Tabo Mbeki high level panel. And she's now on the UN Financial Accountability, Transparency and Integrity panel, the UN FACTI panel. Thanks so much, Irene, for making yourself available to join us today. We know that you had other engagements uh, and congratulations on the launch of the interim report. So almost at the same time as the launch, we saw the revelations in the FinCEN leaks that provided further evidence of this fractured global financial system that we currently living with. And we've heard about how important information on beneficial ownership is and yet even the australian statistics that are that, that are so good they don't provide that information so what do you think this means for the banking statistics that are actually available to us right now thanks very much um asha and also to the colleagues and uh, particularly to, to andres i think it's, it's been a it's been a, a very educative um session and just mindful of the fact that um the, the work that we are looking at is very technical, it is very complex. And so because of that, a lot of, of um, ordinary citizens and even civil society actors who are not working on issues of financial transparency are not able to engage effectively. Many law enforcement agents are not able to engage effectively. I think it's, it's really important to have these sort of discussions, um, which helps to break down you know, in, in regular terminology, what are the implications of the current system? Um, so bearing that in mind, and, and also the, the, in, the interest in this, you know, when I, when I got the invitation, I shared it with, with my networks um, back in Uganda, and there was interest in it from, from, from many people who are not necessarily in, in working in this field. I just thought uh, it would be useful to start off by, you know, a little, a little bit of information. Um, one of them, when we're talking about the global financial system, we're, we're talking about the worldwide framework of, of legal agreements, um, institutions, and economic actors that together facilitate international flows of financial capital for purposes of investment and trade financing. And, and I would add to that, um, say wealth or wealth creation or profit generation. So what are the challenges in that, in that uh, financial system? You know, the, the FinCEN leaks that uh, came out recently um, were from information published by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists who have been behind um, similar information in the past, the, the Paradise Papers, the Panama Papers and so on, and have really 
done a huge service, I would say, to, to governments mm -hmm. and, and, to, and to the societies by showing how this global financial system is, is actually operating, um, what are the challenges with it, and how much dirty money there is in the system and the nature of actors in, involved in that. So this recent one um, uh, that, that came out, it relates to uh, suspicious activity reports, SARS, that banks or financial intermediaries are required to file with regulators about suspicious client behavior. Um, all, SARS uh, all SARS on transactions globally that involve the dollar go to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network in the US Treasury. So this recent leak related to files that have been received between 2000 and 2017 from banks reporting suspicious behavior of, of clients. And, and the files um, covered a, a, a minuscule percentage of, of the, the SARS reports in that 17 year period. Um, 2,657 documents uh, involving 2,121 SARS suspicious activity reports, mostly to US authorities. So what are the implications of that? Um, one of the things really is just the extraordinary figures involved in terms of funds. That um, these reports, which, which represent a very small fraction of the, the suspicious activity reports made over 17 years. I, I read somewhere, I think it, it talked about something like 0.02% or something like that of those reports in that period. Nevertheless, they represented over $2 trillion worth of transactions by these mm -hmm. banks. So we're talking about large amounts of money at a time when governments and societies lack funds for mm -hmm. public services needed, very much so in the time of COVID, but even prior to that. We know the kind mm -hmm. of constraints that uh, many countries, developing countries particularly, but also other countries have been mm -hmm. facing. For, for investment, you know, in, in building up their societies. One of the things for me that, that, that really this flags, and, and this is something that, that was mentioned by the, the New York um, uh, regulator, is, is that the existing due diligence requirements on banks are not effective enough. So the money flows, the dirty money flows in the system to, and the, the flows of funds to the offshore world are not sufficiently or effectively prevented by existing requirements. So this also demonstrates the role that banks play in facilitating financial crime. So whether it is fraud, money laundering, or, or even terrorist financing, uh, given the kind of, of actors, the kind of clients whose funds have been, who, whose dirty money has been allowed to get into the system, these, these kind of challenges show that self-regulation is not sufficient. There is, there is need to have effective oversight of the system by regulators. And I dare say, given the vested interests involved, so there are incentives that the banks have you know, to, to, to send reports in late, to continue to receive uh, clients' money even after flagging, that those particular clients are involved with suspicious activities because of the kind of fees that they that they receive from handling the, the funds. So they are incentives. Uh, they are they are incentivized to continue doing the wrong thing, especially when the fines that they that they may they may face when caught uh, are, are much smaller than the kind of fees that they uh, and, and the profits that they generate from handling such money. So the, so this I would say really demonstrates the need to have regulation and that the regulatory regimes, the oversight have to be strengthened, both at, at a national level, but also at a global level. Um, the, mm. the, other, the other thing that is quite shocking with them is that, that these are not small banks we're talking about. We're talking about global players. So there are some myths, I would say, um, that, that many of us, many, many ordinary people have when looking at what is wrong in the financial system, what is not working. Some of the myths are about the kind of actors involved in this. So you have on the one hand, uh, institutions um, like banks that on the face of it seem to be highly respectable, but 
are actually playing a role in enabling dirty money into the system and in, them, in some cases themselves uh, booking profits uh, through tax, tax havens. So the role of bankers, the role of accountants, the role of auditors, the role of lawyers like myself, you know, big uh, legal firms, is, is something that a spotlight needs to be put on much more. I would say that um, this leak really underlined that some of the, the conclusions and the approaches that, that we took on the FACTI panel and that in that process were really borne out. Um, the importance of dealing with the international uh, architecture relating to tax and tax cooperation, the need to deal, to deal with the same in relation to accountability and public reporting and anti-corruption, the interlinkages between what on the one hand appear to be purely commercial or tax issues with the seamier side of the global financial system, issues around corruption and so on, and, and how, how closely linked um, are the, 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 the kind of uh, practices around say tax avoidance and tax evasion and how the same channels are used by, by those who seem to be um, respectable act players in the system and those who are, rec are accepted as, as, um, as, uh, as, as criminals or as, as, as corrupt. So the, 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 there is a need to, to unpack some of those myths and, and deal, and deal with, with both sides, um, both the seemingly respectable as well as, as, as the rest. Um, generally, this, these leaks indicate quite, quite clearly that there is a system, a system problem. It's a systematic, a systematic issue that is, uh, that is, is uh, involved. And, and therefore that calls um, for what some of my colleagues have already talked about, uh, the need to have uh, much more cooperation um, at a regional level, but even more fundamentally, the need to, to, to raise this to an international level and to have a global cooperation within the multilateral system to, to address some of the challenges. Um, currently, some, some of the, the mechanisms that exist and, and, and they have been talked about, for example, relating to automatic exchange of information, there, there are a lot of, there, there are some positives and some progress from them. Uh, however, from, from our uh, consultations, uh, what we found is that there are also loopholes and, and challenges, uh, not only challenges of, of technical capacity, which, which have really been spoken to ably um, by my colleagues, but also the need to have rules that relate to different regions and contexts. And, and to ensure that countries across the world and from, particularly from developing country regions are able to participate in rule setting uh, to ensure that those rules uh, relate to the context within which they operate. And Nana uh, spoke to some, 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 of, those, some of those issues. Uh, there, there are a lot of vested interests in, in, involved in this. I mean, think about the kind of money involved, uh, the benefits um, both to the players, to the banks themselves, and other actors who use the system, but also in some cases um, to countries. Uh, this for me flags the issue of the whole political economy of, of, this, of this issue. Uh, on the one hand, the, the, the power or the power of the, the actors who currently benefit from the status quo vis-a-vis -vis the rest. And, 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 mm. and, and that, that power asymmetry is both at the level of countries, uh, so be between uh, advanced economies and, uh, where you have the major financial centers but, uh, mm. and developing countries, but also between uh, individuals or institutions within, within the system yes. and hence the mm. need for cooperation. I would say um, the need for a, a, a coalition, a progressive coalition to be built that brings mm. in um, those who currently lose from the system. And uh, the point that Abdul made, you know, about how um, the, 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 the benefits are not necessarily uh, you know, the, the jurisdictions that host, that, that host uh, financial centers do not necessarily benefit uh, uh, as a whole uh, for, for, mm. from these sorts of practices. So even in countries where, where you may have um, the havens, uh, even in countries where you may have the financial centers, you will have groups who lose out because the, the, the money that, uh, that, that is, is, is being generated and hidden in the system mm. is really, really accrues to particular actors, to particular players. So I would say that this progressive coalition is not just a coalition of, of uh, developing countries or actors from developing countries, but actors from across the world who collectively lose out 
from a system that allows dirty money to, to permeate and then to begin to influence how business mm. is done, influence how economies are run, influence how policy yeah. decisions are made by policymakers. And so people like, like Andreas, you know, the, the kind of role that you're playing is really demonstrates that this kind of progressive coalition is one that needs to be global. Thank you so much for that, Irene. I just, I'm, I'm just going to pick up on two things. The one is that uh, this notion of self-regulation, the FinCEN leaks have made it very clear that self-regulation is just not good enough, that there needs to be rules external rules that actually govern banking institutions in a in more robust rules. And this last point that you made about this coalition, it reminds me of uh, this concept of the United Democratic Front, a united front against, and that united front is, is, is a broad church in a sense that has a range of different uh, groups that in other circumstances might actually be competing, but here you kind of united against a common, a common uh, united for a common outcome and against a common enemy, so to say. Um, on that note, I have to say, I'm going to ask you in, you know, just in one or 30 seconds or, or so, uh, to look into the crystal ball. And uh, that, that's the only way I can describe this question because it's really about how do you see the US uh, progressing in, in, in this respect? Do you see that there's going to be reciprocity, full reciprocity? Are they going to join the common reporting standard? And do you see any potential momentum to actually push them in that direction? Mm. It obviously is a looking into the crystal ball, you know, based on uh, the elections, but please let's hear your, your views very quickly. Yeah, just just very very quickly. I would I would say that this uh, there's a simple answer. It depends. <laughs> it depends yeah. on on on, yes, <laughs> on many things. Yeah. So, so so obviously yeah. there, there there are issues around the leadership, you know, of of, of of the of the country, and we have we know that there's an election, um, you know, in less than two months. Uh, but it also depends on action taken uh, at different levels. So action uh, within the U.S. itself. Um, whether it is uh, from, say, from, from Congress, you know, from in, influential political figures who, who, who pick this issue up. Um, we saw with previous leaks, um, say, with the Panama Papers, that there, there was a, variety, a range of actions depending also on the mobilization that happened in country by different actors. So it, it reinforces the point earlier made, uh, I forget who's, who said it, about the need to push. I think it was, it was Efren, the need, the need to push, the, the need for, for actors uh, who, who are working on these sorts of, of areas to mobilize and do a lot more advocacy and publicity around mm. it, um, mm. to, to engage to engage with with the with parliamentarians yeah. and so on, so it, it yeah. very much depends on depends on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll wait with bated breath for November. Is all I can say for now. Um, we have one question. Thank you so much to all the panelists. We have one question uh, and one participant who would like to actually make a comment. Um, the question is: How many countries in Africa? are members of the network of the automatic exchange of uh, information system currently. This question is from Emmanuel Dunia. Uh, I think I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Perhaps uh, Nana or Ifram would want to answer that question. Uh, thank you very much. We have not been doing very well in this area when it comes to the African continent. I think we have mm -hmm. only five countries. That's uh, Mauritius, Seychelles, South Africa, Ghana and recently Nigeria. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, um, and I understand, uh, th thank you very much, Ephraim. I understand that um, uh, Go Nagata from the ADB would like to speak for two minutes. Um, we have some time, so we can actually turn to Go. Oh, can, can, the, can you unmute and uh, allow the Hi. person to speak? Okay, great. There you are. Yeah, uh, yeah. actually, I'm Gong Nagata from Asian Development Bank. And uh, uh, with Aurora, I'm working for taxation issue. So I just want to add, uh, I mean, uh, basically, uh, 
uh, what she said is uh, all about AOI. Uh, but uh, yeah, and uh, I just want to mention something about our regional hub. Uh, so uh, this is our uh, initiative that uh, strengthens the LM and ITC. And uh, the idea is uh, to, uh, as, as she said, uh, uh, bring together, bring together uh, regional and also international uh, expertise and knowledge uh, to uh, to uh, to support Asian Pacific countries, and uh, at the same time we will mainstream. Uh, uh, I mean, ADB will mainstream uh, DLM and the international co tax cooperation in our uh, in our operation. And uh, just one thing, as a development bank, uh, uh, we generally support our DMC and ITC through uh, technical assistance project. And uh, so one of our strengths is to can utilize uh, a lending modality. So that's a one lending modality such as a policy-based lending loan. And those, those initiatives basically uh, initially support uh, uh, domestic, uh, uh, raise tax uh, tax to GDP ratio and also uh, more engagement with international tax standard. Uh, and uh, our long term purpose is to help uh, our DMC, uh, the development members to uh, achieve sustainable development goals. Uh, that's all about it. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Go. Uh, Shashika, uh, Shakshi, sorry, you have, uh, you would like to jump in? We can't hear you. Still. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Um, so I just want to reiterate what I had said earlier. Should you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or type in the question using the Q&A option. We already have had a few Q &A, um, questions on, under the Q&A uh, section and we've had them answered. So please feel free, um, use this as a platform for um, better engagement. Okay, we have about eight minutes more. Um, perhaps the speakers, uh, the panelists, Andres, perhaps something uh, has come to your minds that you would like to actually uh, expand upon. I know, Abdul, they were, you, you really cut your presentation short due to time constraints. Maybe you want to talk more about those multilateral options uh, and, uh, you know, go beyond the Ecuador experience and uh, lessons. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sasha. So uh, basically, the uh, multilaterally, the issue to be uh, focused upon specifically would be the way the multilateral um, convention on automatic uh, on um, uh, on uh, mutual assistance on uh, yes. the MCA basically uh, on administrative assistance. I always struggle with the full form. Yeah, of <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it very long. long. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the way that's been designed, you know, because. Um, there it's not that you sign up to it and then you get information from everybody it's really it's like a two-layered process so within that there's a second layer where only those uh, jurisdictions which have agreed to share information would uh, you know would, would then would then give out the information so that is something where you know, andres had mentioned that uh, there are these jurisdictions which uh, just opt for voluntary secrecy so there uh, needs to be some reform to that particular problem to uh, make sure that you know we can really force these countries to uh, to share their information yeah mm -hmm. yeah so to reform the multilateral system um andres is there anything that you would like to add uh you've heard all the panelists that mm, please go ahead yeah, uh yeah, thanks, Asha, and thanks for all the panelists. Really good comments and, and different frameworks and perspectives on this. I mean, our point is that for six years, we have been criticizing the CRS. I mean, it's great that there is automatic exchange, but we want the US to be part of it. We try to get um, Europe, at least the EU, to impose sanctions on the US so that they would reciprocate or join the CRS. We try to make, I mean, again, they have non-reciprocity only in favor of tax havens. You're allowed not to receive information, but what would make a lot of sense is to enable developing countries. I mean, I think it was Nana saying that it's actually very costly for developing countries to join the system, have the technical infrastructure. So it would be quite obvious that say, okay, let's give them time to send information, but let's let them receive information from the, from, from the onset. Unfortunately, that's not happening. 
And our point is that we've tried through the FTC many times, just really uh, trying to advocate for, for developing countries. And that's why I feel those statistics are so relevant because finally we have something and we're just trying to make the best use of that. And we really hope that developing countries, not only that they will try to join the system, but that they would push developed countries and financial centers to publish statistics. And clearly mm. there's no confidentiality here. We don't know anyone's name. It's just a total by country. Yeah. So it's almost like a no brainer to me that this should be published, especially because authorities have the information already. They have to collect yeah. it and then share it. I mean, when they share it, they do give the detail. John owns this much money, but they could simply mm. add it and publish it. So we do know, we do need more countries to do this. I mean, mm. if there's extra, I think Mark, um, from TJ in Australia is here. I don't know if, I mean, I, I think he was earlier. And maybe if he could share in a few minutes how they managed to get uh, a legal amendment. Uh, because again, Australia mm. is now the case that we have. It could go better, but it's still impressive compared to, to the rest of the countries. Yeah. So if, if yeah. there are no questions, Mark is available. I don't know if um, you could tell a bit about how you got uh, Australia to do this. While we're waiting to see, Shakshi, can you just check if Mark is available? And while we're waiting uh, for that, um, there's a question that I actually have. I have to say I registered for this panel as a participant at the beginning, long before I was. So there's a question I have uh, really as a, as a participant now. You mentioned in your presentation that uh, with, with Australia, you, we, you receive the account balances, but not the income. And uh, being a lawyer, a human rights lawyer, I actually have no idea what the significance of these two different figures are. I saw on the report, you know, in your, in, in your presentation and your blog, I saw the differences and everything. But I would just like to understand what is the significance of having both those figures and how does it help? How does it help in terms of uh, understanding our advocacy roles? There's another question, so I'll be very brief on the answer. The okay. problem with the balance is that that's just a photo taken usually on December 31st. And the problem is that if by December 30th, you withdraw all your money, by December 31st, your account balance will be zero. And then you can put it back in January 1st, to say. So the account mm -hmm. balance could easily be manipulated. The income, uh, at least just all the income that you had. So we were also asking for at least the highest balance that you had during the year. And our point is that, again, we just need more data to start doing those calculations. Okay. The Netherlands yeah. and an outlier, just when we checked what others were reporting and by comparing income to the balance. So it's mm -hmm. not like income is indispensable. I mean, income is very relevant for authorities because usually the tax, what the income tax would be yeah. on the income and not on the on balance. The I mean, have a wealth yeah. tax. Um, okay. I mean, I just, I, I'll try to let Irene maybe answer the other one, but yeah, happy to then, that my email is there and happy to answer more questions that, that come up. Later. Yeah, yeah. Irene, there's a question, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but it's a question from Alex regarding uh, the FACTI panel's interim report that notes weaknesses of public statistics in this area. And he would like to know, is the panel considering proposing a UN body with a mandate for this type of global tax data? Thanks. Yeah, as we know, the, the, the FACTI final report should be coming out in, in, will be coming out in February of next year. So we've just concluded the interim report, which, which only, which had our findings and conclusions without recommendations attached to that. And so the work that we'll be doing in the second phase will be focusing on, on clarifying the information and talking to, to regional blocks so that we can, we can get more regional perspectives as, as well as more uh, engagement with experts. And then that will help us to shape the final recommendations. And um, there currently are two, have been two proposals, two, two lines of, of argument, one would say to the panel, one of them is around, uh, around um, strengthening existing mechanisms and, and leaving it at that, which, which likely means um, mainly OECD-led mechanisms that, or, 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 or EU-led mechanisms that are, are currently uh, in, uh, engaged in by, by countries outside of, of, of the OECD. Or the second way, where there was also a strong push was around having a, a, a multilateral uh, mechanism within the UN, UN system, uh, which would, would then be a, a, a much more, more, more inclusive uh, global, global system. And so, so those are the two issues that, that are currently being, being considered. What I would mm -hmm. say is, is that it's, it is really important 
um, that uh, that groups that are invested in in the in the, an outcome on that issue engage with the panel, engage with the process, provide evidence, provide information that can that can ensure that we have uh, a, a decision on that, which 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 uh, helps to strengthen uh, a, a more inclusive. And, and and more legitimate uh, system at the end of the day. So that that is what I would I would I would say that engaging the process, uh, whether we're talking about civil society groups or even um, state actors, uh, to 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 shape the outcome. Uh, so, so that that that, that is mm. what I, I I can say at this point. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm going to close the panel and um, now just um, by saying that saying firstly thank you to all of you for really really deeply insightful and educational i have to say uh presentations and and comments uh i also um feel the challenge that you place on us as civil society uh to take advocacy initiatives forward on so many different levels that you've identified i'm not going to try to summarize them all right now because we we really out of time but just to say it definitely is we definitely end this panel with a with a clarion call, you could say, for collective action going forward. Uh, over to you, Shakshi, to close to to round everything up. Thank you very much once again. Thanks, Asha. Um, just on behalf of the organizers and my organization, the Center for Budget and Governance Accountability, I would again like to thank everyone for joining us. Um, I, would, I would reiterate that the pith and core of democracy relies on transparency and accountability. What matters to us is not just access to information, but the quality of information that is actually provided to developing countries. We, as the Financial uh, Transparency Coalition, will continue to engage with these issues, um, which push the mandate of curtailing illicit financial flows and establishing a sustainable and resilient financial system that works for all. We will be in touch with you all, and we will be sure to provide you with all the materials that have come out of this webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you much. So much. Thank you. Thank you.